All right, everyone. Let's get started, please. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sammy Khan, and I am the Executive Director of the Council on Science and Technology here at Princeton University, and I want to welcome you to our annual Women in STEM panel. Over the next hour, we're going to have a chance to hear the stories and journeys through STEM of six wonderful women who are here to join us today. Uh, and you'll have a chance to ask questions and engage in the conversation as well. Um, but before we get started in that, I'd just like to share with you a little bit about the Council on Science and Technology, or CST, at so you can understand how this panel fits in to our broader mission. The CST at Princeton University works to promote STEM literacy at the university and beyond. And we do this through really robust collaborations with our colleagues in STEM departments, in the arts, humanities, and social sciences, with the goal of ensuring that everyone in the Princeton community and beyond has the opportunity and the encouragement to in STEM in their everyday lives, in their careers or future careers, and in society at large. And we do this in a variety of ways. First, we actually uh, help to develop courses here at the university. If you've ever seen courses with the prefix uh, STC, those are courses that our office has had a hand in the development of and potentially even the teaching of those courses. We are also the entity on campus that gives those STN or STL designations, which says that those courses are robust and engaging and are uh, uh, rigorous enough to fulfill certain requirements. We also engage in STEM education research to ensure that we're using best practices and also to participate in the greater uh, scholarly dialogue on STEM education. And finally, we do programs like this to ensure that we're getting STEM out there to the community. So we have panels, we have um, all kinds of seminars and symposia and other opportunities throughout the year for you to engage with us. We also have a couple of spaces that I'd like you to know about. Our offices are located in the Lewis Science Library. On the second floor, you're welcome to visit us anytime. But we also have a very unique space called the Studio Lab that is in the basement of Fine Hall, which is that large, tall, brown math building. Um, the Studio Lab is a very unique space because unlike more traditional maker spaces, it is a creative technology lab that allows you to let your artistic and technological um, juices flow wildly. You can engage in everything from 3D printers and CNC and vinyl cutters and laser cutters, but also studio lighting and other type motion capture and VR and other things that you can work with, even sewing machines and embroidery machines machines so that you can really learn new things that you have never tried before. Um, and that's available to you tomorrow. In fact, we're going to have an open house in the studio lab between 1 and 3. And we'll have ice cream available. Uh, and you'll be able to join in that. So we work very, very hard here at the university to ensure that everyone can find their home in STEM. Um, we'd really love you to help us understand a little bit more about how we can serve you better. So I think when you came in, you were given a survey that well, we'd ask you to fill out, if you don't mind, before you leave today and turn that in. And if you do, you'll be entered to win in a raffle um, a CST sweatshirt just in time for these nice uh, chilly mornings uh, here in the fall. And that will be raffled off. We'll be raffling off three of the sweatshirts at the end of the month. So hopefully you'll join in in that. So in order to get us started, I'd like to introduce the wonderful scientists that we have with us today. Starting from my left, we have Dr. Mala Murthy from the Department of Neuroscience. We have Dr. Janine Nunes from Chemical and Biological Engineering. We have Dr. Jen, uh, Jen Rexford from Computer Science. Jen is not only the chair of the department, but also an alum of Princeton 91. Is that correct? Wonderful. We also have Dr. Cassie Stoddard, um, who is from the, forgive me, Cassie, I just went blank, uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And also from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, we have Dr. Karina Tarnita. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have our student representative with us. That is Ruka Alor, who is a senior in neuroscience, but she's also pre-med. Uh, and she works with Dr. Murthy in her lab in neuroscience. 
So what we are going to do is I've asked each of our panelists to take about five to six minutes to share with you their STEM journeys, a little bit about their research, their, their uh, journey through STEM, and also to maybe give a little bit of advice uh, for your journey here at Princeton. And um, so we're just really going to go down the line, and then after everybody has a chance to present, we're going to open it up to questions, and you'll have a chance to ask questions and engage in that conversation. So without further ado, Dr. Murthy, if you don't mind starting us off. Thanks, Sammy. Is this, is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in addition to being a professor in the Neuroscience Institute, I'm actually also uh, a member of the Council of Science and Technology, and I can attest that it's a really um, wonderful thing here on campus um, that does a lot of um, kind of important uh, integration of science and technology with the rest of campus. So um, you should check out those events as you uh, continue your experience here. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background on myself, and then um, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you all have. So um, let's see, I've been a faculty member here for 10 years, um, sort of nine, about nine and a half years. Um, and uh, my lab basically works on acoustic communication, so how the brain produces sound, um, like speech, and also processes sound. Um, although we do all of that in the uh, fruit fly, in the fly model organism. And uh, flies actually use uh, acoustic communication signals like many animals, um, so they're great model systems for this kind of research. I got my start, um, I guess, in high school. I was really interested in science and math, as probably most of you in this room uh, were, and then uh, decided to go to MIT for college. Um, it was a big leap. I went to a, uh, a high school in Texas that didn't have any AP classes, and none of my classmates um, had heard of MIT uh, or were going there. And, um, and so, you know, it was a real shock. Um, I took physics for the first time my freshman year, you know, but I, I loved it. I was super passionate about science and math. Um, I had done some research during my summers in high school. Um, and so it was that passion that just fueled me through college and got me through all of the difficult classes. So I chose to major in biology, which was course seven at MIT. Um, there was no real neuroscience major back then. Um, there was psychology and biology, and biology seemed like a better fit. I loved it. Um, I did research actually on aging using yeast cells. If you're interested in that, I can tell you more about that later. Um, and then I decided to do a PhD in neuroscience, uh, and I went to Stanford. And um, that's when I actually started working on fruit flies, um, was in my thesis research. Um, and I was studying different questions back then, actually how um, the synapse works and how signals are transmitted from one side of the synapse to the other. Um, and then during the course of my PhD, I became interested in perception, how the brain actually perceives information from the outside world. And um, that um, spurred a big change in my research direction to pursue what's called systems neuroscience, or thinking about how circuits of neurons um, actually enable things like actions, you know, behaviors, thoughts, et cetera, um, which requires a lot of computational neuroscience and math. And that was a really good fit for me because it's something I'd always loved. And um, if I, to give you any advice, it's to not be afraid to do things you don't know how to do already. That's been like, the um, motto of my career is to just, you know, if I'm interested in something, I just do it, and I learn all the skills along the way. So to not, um, to not think that I already have to be trained in something to move into a new area. Um, and so, yeah, that was the beginning of all of this. I joined a postdoc to do computational neuroscience, systems neuroscience work. That was at Caltech. And then about three years later, I got a job here at Princeton, and um, I've been here ever since. So anyway, it's ha I'm happy to be here today, and I look forward to hearing what these wonderful women have to say. Thanks so much, Dr. Murthy. Dr. Nunes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janine Nunes. I, uh, as Sami mentioned, I lecture in CBE, so that's the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. I'm also a research scholar in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. Uh, so, uh, a little bit of background, I'm actually not trained as an engineer, all of my degrees are in chemistry actually. Um, so I started as an international student, I came to the US, uh, 
as an undergraduate, I did my BS and MS degrees at a small HBCU, so Morgan State University in Baltimore. Um, and then I decided to go to grad school and did my PhD in chemistry, focusing on polymers and materials at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and after that, I came here, started as a postdoc, and been here ever since. I've been here about the same about the time, <laughs> uh, about nine years. Uh, so uh, what sort of inspired me to get into chemistry? It was just, um, I, I would have to say, it, the material interested me a lot. Um, and I realized very early on I liked experimentation. So starting as an undergrad, uh, second semester freshman year, I actually started in the lab, and I've been in the lab ever since. Um, and it's where my passion is. My other passion is teaching, um, and I enjoy engaging with students, um, usually on small uh, individual and, and small group settings. So uh, this sort of environment, um, th this is well out of my comfort zone. But I'm here <laughs> to interact with you, and, and hopefully you have questions for me. Um, so the research that I do now, uh, I'm still very much interested in polymers and materials and gels, especially squishy materials and what, uh, how we can make them uh, and how they can be useful. Uh, for example, one of the things I'm working on right now are um, these microscale materials that aggregate into larger structures that can be useful in tissue cultures and in wound healing applications. Um, as part of the teaching that I've done, I started actually in the freshman seminar programs. I don't know if any of you are planning on taking any freshman sem courses. Um, great opportunity for small group um, and small classroom interactions. And, and actually the Council of Science and Technology helped me a lot when I was designing the course and um, working on the material. Uh, most recently, I work uh, I'm part of the teaching team for Core Lab in CBE, which is one of the more rigorous courses that are taught to the upperclassmen in CBE. Um, and, and so what I think I will do with my time, and you can always ask me questions afterwards about my research, is um, give you some advice uh, based on my many interactions with undergraduates, because I, I, I work almost exclusively with undergraduates, except for most recently in research setting as well as in uh, the classroom. Um, and a couple of just notes. Uh, you have a lot of opportunity here at Princeton with your curricular activities, your coursework. You're gonna be exposed to all of these amazing courses and you're gonna wanna take certifications and, and work in your major, et cetera. Um, Co-curricular activities as well as extracurricular activities. And you're probably capable of taking on large amounts of, of activities and events. Um, but think carefully, because you may not, even though you can, um, you may not necessarily need to or want to think about um, what the costs are of taking on full course loads, as well as being a part of several organizations, as, as well as um, uh, any other type of activity. I've seen a lot of times uh, students, you get the grade, sure, but you sort of miss out on some of the um, more holistic side of, of it. You miss the bigger picture and you don't delve as deeply into the material, especially in your coursework. Um, and of course, you know, you end up exhausted and, and, <laughs> and so weigh the costs of, of what is important to you. Because uh, I know a lot of the advice I'm giving you, I've ignored <laughs> and done the opposite. <laughs> so as an undergraduate, I took full courses, I was in research all the time, and sure, I got the grade, um, but at the end of, the, there was a cost uh, to my social life, uh, there was a cost, uh, there's, there's also always that emotional and mental cost associated with that, and whether it was actually worth it at the end, I'm not sure. Um, so think carefully, uh, talk to your peers, talk to your academic advisors, and just see what makes sense for you. Um, and don't judge based on what the person next to you is doing, because uh, you each have your own path to follow. Um, 
and that's what's most important. Um, I think I will let uh, the next one talk, but I have lots more advice, so I'll talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Nunes. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Jen Rexford. I'm in the computer science department. And what I've always loved about computer science from when I got my first computer was how it really lowers the barrier to who gets to innovate. Even in just the first few months of learning to program, I was exciting, excited that I could create something new that was completely of my own making. And we try to capture that joy in our intro computer science course, Coast 126, where we do assignments ranging from things in music and art and science to really show how multifaceted the field can be and the different things students can do with it. In my current research, I focus a lot on the technology underlying the internet. And there, too, I want the infrastructure on the inside of the internet to be able to be changed more readily. The, the great irony of the internet is that the computers connected to it change frequently. The services and applications running on them change frequently. The plumbing on the inside, not so much. And part of my mission in my research is to design technologies that lower the barrier to making change. Uh, on the parts of the internet that determine how reliable, secure, and performant it is, how well it supports anonymity, circumventing censorship, and things of that ilk. And so there I can feel the work is both technically exciting uh, and also to me very personally purposeful beyond the, the sort of intellectual challenges that underlie it. And that's one thing I think in all of the work any of us do, I think we find a, a deep and abiding sense of purpose beyond the intellectual joy, uh, which so those two things together just make it uh, really heady uh, kind of set of fields that I think we're all in. I think in terms of advice, I have two pieces of advice. I think a lot of people, particularly women, struggle with confidence. And I have a few things to say on the subject of confidence. The first one is that I think people tend to judge how they're doing in their chosen field by how they think the people around them are doing. And it's just the, the case that a lot of the, your male classmates may project more confidence than they actually have. And you may think you're not doing as well as you actually are. And I would just encourage you to try to really track how you're actually doing, not how you think your peers are doing. And it's very hard because you don't always know the, the signals to look for. But you know, if you have any doubts, talk to the professor in your course rather than react to the confidence of the people around you. Uh, a second thing is people often judge how they're doing in a field based on how they're doing in other subjects. And, and so you may think, well, you're doing really great in English or history or some other subject and think you're struggling more in your technical classes. And that may be true, but it doesn't mean you're not amazing in the subject you're choosing to study as well. So it would just encourage you to, to not get discouraged if you feel other courses come easier to you, if, if you're excited about your STEM course or your STEM field, uh, to go for it, even if you find other subjects potentially seemingly more easy. Uh, and finally, uh, Sarah Jane Leslie, a, a colleague of all of ours, who's the dean of the grad school, did a really fascinating study about representation of women in different fields based on how that field perceives itself to be relying on hard work or on natural brilliance to succeed. And as you might expect, if a field is, perceives itself to rely on brilliance, innate somehow, that it has a low representation of women. And if it is thought to rely more heavily on hard work, you see a high representation of women. And I think that says a lot about uh, how we value hard work and brilliance, because obviously both matter. Uh, we, should, we should really be looking to, to celebrate the importance of both. And also ignores the fact that, of course, there's plenty of scope uh, for brilliance among women as well. But I would just caution you there to, to think about when a field perceives itself the vibe you get from others in the field, is it accurate, actually, about what really really takes to actually uh, succeed in that field? And then the second uh, sort of category of advice I'd have is about community. Uh, Princeton does a fabulous job having you feel like part of a class, a class of 2023. You'll hear it over and over again. You'll, you'll feel it in your residential colleges. But I would encourage you to look for interactions across class years. Sometimes those are a little harder. Uh, to get at Princeton because of the strong class cohort. But your upperclassmen uh, in, in your major and in other classes you're taking are a wealth of information about what courses to take uh, and what, what to do extracurricularly, how to balance the kind of uh, you know, tensions between doing too much uh, that you might feel. And so, for example, in our department, the Princeton Women in Computer Science group is, is really active and focuses a lot on sort of vertical mentoring to have the upperclassmen help the lowerclassmen uh, pick courses and get advice on what is a reasonable course load and to get connected with potential uh, career options down the road. So I just encourage you to look for those cross-class year opportunities for, for mentorship and, and friendship. Thank you so much, Dr. Rexford. Hi, everyone.
everyone. My name is Cassie Stoddard, and I just wanted to say welcome to Princeton. I've been here in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology for three years now, so I guess you could say I'm entering my senior year, but I remember what it was like to just uh, have arrived here and how overwhelming it can be to try to figure out how Princeton works. And so I'd say just give yourself time um, in these weeks to figure out how the semester is going to unfold and, and don't feel any real sense of urgency, although the fact that you're here um, is a good sign that you're starting to think about what you might study down the line. So I became very interested in biology when I was a kid. My grandmother and my mom are good birders and I became really interested in birds and the natural world. I participated in an internship. I grew up in Virginia uh, at the Chesapeake Bay. There's a wonderful institute for marine science, and so I got to spend a summer jumping off of a boat in a wetsuit, and I, I really learned that summer that uh, academia and research and science had a lot to offer. And my parents aren't scientists. There are no PhD scientists in my family. And so this was something that I started to learn about as I entered college and discovered ecology and evolution. In my lab now, we work on questions about animal coloration and color vision, and we tend to focus on, on birds because they have spectacular color vision and they can see a range of colors completely invisible to humans. And I teach a class for upper level uh, students, juniors and seniors. It's mostly for EEB students, but it's open to anyone. And it's called sensory ecology. And we try to understand how animals extract information from their environment and how they use that to behave and evolve. And I think for me, it's really been a wonderful experience teaching this course because I've gotten to interact with Princeton students in a real way. And everyone in that class brings their own personal experience, whether it's uh, how they've communicated with a dog or their fish um, or their, their love of sort of that echolocation from, from childhood, and we get to sort of engage on that level. I was an undergraduate at Yale, and I ended up taking a freshman seminar that allowed us to do research in the collections of a natural history museum. And that was my fall of my freshman year, and I fell in love with the work I was doing, and I ended up joining a lab. And I continued working in that lab for my entire undergraduate career. And so one piece of advice I'd have is, is don't be afraid to go talk to professors, even your freshman year, and think about whether you could get involved in some project in the lab. And maybe you'll find that you really connect with the research and, and love being a part of that community, or maybe you find that you want to explore other labs. But it's not too soon to go talk to people and, and really ask about what it would take to get involved in real research um, behind the scenes. So after my undergrad, I went to do a PhD uh, in England um, at the University of Cambridge. And that was a really uh, eye-opening experience because I'd never lived abroad. And I got to expose myself to a whole different way of thinking about evolutionary biology. And then I, um, I came back to the States and I did a postdoc for several years before coming here to Princeton. And I guess one theme that has run through my research that I think we probably all can relate to is that the work has been really interdisciplinary. And even though I identify as a biologist, I've worked with computer scientists and with physicists and with mechanical engineers and with people with expertise in optics and chemistry. And for me, that's been one of the most rewarding parts of a scientific career, is that I've gotten to learn about these new fields and, and use that knowledge to kind of come up with creative ways of asking new questions in my own subfield. And that's something that I think Princeton will allow you to really see and experience while you're here. So I'll just end with one um, very sort of tangible piece of advice, and that would be to take advantage of your summers on Princeton's dime. Because <laughs> Princeton has such wonderful funding to support undergraduate research and opportunities during the summers. And I got so much when I was a college student out of doing something really different each summer. One summer I went to Costa Rica and I took a four-week field course. Another summer I sat on a rocky island off the coast of Maine and watched gulls. And all that was paid for and it was all really important for my development. So look for opportunities now 
that you might be eligible for and really just go after those and apply for them so that you can do something really interesting and exciting in your summers. Uh, there are many opportunities in EEB and through the Princeton Environmental Institute, and those opportunities exist for, uh, for freshmen and sophomores. So do, do ask about that and, and look it up. That's it, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoddard. <laughs> Dr. Tornita. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Corina Tornita. Um, I'm in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, how many freshmen do we have here? Just so I have a sense, is everyone? <laughs> wow, okay, impressive. Welcome to Princeton. Um, so I um, am in EB, but I'm actually trained as a mathematician. Both my undergraduate and my PhDs are in math. Um, I did both at Harvard. Um, and I started to like math, well, I started to do math very early on um, because uh, my mom is a mechanical engineer and she thought that math is the most important language to learn, uh, more important than Romania, and I come from Romania. Um, she just thought it's, it's the clearest language, and, and I agree with her, it's just that I wasn't so fond of it when I was three or four years old. Um, it took me a while to warm up to it, but I, there, is, there is something about learning it very early and kind of getting really comfortable with it. Um, I didn't really think I was good at anything else, so I came to Harvard determined that I was going to do math, and, and um, um, I, I, I did my undergraduate degree in math. I, I really enjoyed it. I loved my senior thesis and experience, and then stayed as a graduate student to continue to do the same kind of work, very pure math. I was an algebraic geometer. Um, but then at some, point, at some point during my PhD, I realized that um, I, I had what I call a quarter life crisis because I'm very optimistic about how long I will live. Um, I, I started to feel very, um, uh, very claustrophobic. Math is really fun, but it can also be kind of isolating because it's been researched for thousands of years. You end up, when you, when you finally find your problem, it's so narrow um, that maybe, you know, three or four other people in the world know what you're working on and, and care about it. And um, I, I really had quite an identity crisis because I, I always thought of myself as a, you know, budding uh, or aspiring mathematician. Um, and I just happened to have a very wise advisor to whom I finally confessed one day that I was starting to feel very uncertain about this. It, it, it took me a long time to admit to it, but, but I did, and, and I'm very happy I did because he advised me to just, he told me, oh, you're probably burnt out, just go read some, some book that has to do with math, but with none of the math that you've done before. Um, and I went to the math library, and um, math books, are mostly brown, and so I was a little bit overwhelmed by how brown everything looked, didn't really know how to pick the book. So I picked the one, I thought, well, okay, I'll start with the one that has a colorful cover. Um, and it happened to be a book that was called The Equations of Life. It was about how you use math to explore biology. And it really was an amazing experience. I, I couldn't put it down. It was like reading you know, a, a murder mystery. It was just like I couldn't put it down for two or three weeks. Um, because I, I actually never thought I was going to be good at biology. I hadn't taken any biology as an undergraduate student. I hadn't taken any biology since high school. I thought I was terrible at it because I could never remember anything. I didn't have any kind of good system to remember any of the things that everyone else seemed to, you know, or, or everyone else who liked biology seemed to love to, to do. Um, and all of a sudden, something that I was good at, math, was giving me this whole different lens on, on a part of the world that I had completely uh, given up on. And, and I, it was amazing, and, and, and that's how my love of biology started. And I started to, um, during my last year of PhD, I started to work on um, applications of math uh, to biology. And specifically, I was interested in, how, uh, in why there is so much cooperation in the, in the world from, from single cells to human beings. Why do we cooperate when there is so much temptation to um, cheat? Um, here, uh, after, after I finished my PhD, I stayed as a, as a fellow at Princeton for, uh, sorry, at Harvard for three years. And then I came here. So I've been here for about six and a half years. Um, I really 
really love it here. My work is also very interdisciplinary, and I think Princeton has this amazing, um, this one amazing attribute that makes interdisciplinarity very easy. It's, it's small. It's just the right size. Everything is close. So you don't have to take a bus and drive for 45 minutes um, to get somewhere to interact with you know, an engineer if you're a biologist. It's, it's very, very easy. Within five minutes, you basically are in every other uh, place or 10 minutes. Um, so it's a great place to be interdisciplinary. Um, and my work is, um, so what, what my lab does is we think about how complexity arises out of simple, very simple interactions between individuals, whether it's single cells that interact with each other and then you end up with differentiated tissues like a lung or a liver, or um, whether it's ants, how do millions of ants in a colony know exactly what to do when there isn't actually a blueprint telling them how to build a nest or how to, um, how to, who goes to, who gets to go out to forage, who gets to stay home and nurse, you know, why don't they end up in these dead ends where everyone stays home and, and nurses and, and nobody uh, gathers food? Um, so so that, those kinds of questions, how do simple interactions between individuals lead to these uh, emergent patterns of behavior? Um, in terms of advice, so I teach, um, I teach every two years or so, I teach a freshman seminar, um, and um, every year I teach a course on why we want to do math in biology. It's the course I wish I had taken at some point, um, but I kind of discovered it for myself, and then I thought I would do that. Without any expectation of, of, of background in either math or biology, I try to introduce students to why, why on earth would you do math in biology. Um, and I must say that really I've had such a great experience teaching the same material as a freshman seminar. Um, when you come here, you're all so uninhibited. And this is part of my advice. Just that's extremely important. You ask unbelievably creative questions because you're not yet worried about your grade and you're not yet worried about you know, where you are situated on some curve or whatnot. Those are some of the best questions I've, I've heard. And I think it's really important to, to just keep that. You know, at some point, you start to be a little bit more blasé. Maybe you take too many courses. Maybe you don't really know how to select them. You get more tired. Uh, don't do that. If you feel like that's happening, just come talk to me. <laughs> and um, other than that, I would say for me the most important things, I mean, when I was tailoring my course, when I was, you know, designing my course, it struck me how much I forgot from when I was an undergrad. It's, and, and it wasn't that late, after, you know, that long after being an undergrad. So, so you actually forget a lot of information. The things you don't forget are ways to think. Um, and so try to pick your classes in such a way that you learn how to think. And really, a very important way to learn how to think is to take classes that challenge you, that are outside of your comfort zone. Because then you get to really hone your skills of, 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 of really um, understanding how to think about a subject. And so, so don't be afraid to do that. Don't feel that, you know, I did that. I took mostly math courses, and Harvard forced me to take you know, seven or eight courses that were outside of math. And, and um, I would say that a couple of those, for example, a cognitive psychology course that I took, I never thought I would enjoy it, but I had to take it, um, really stuck with me as a very interesting, you know, kind of opening my, my brain to other ways of thinking about the world. Um, and finally, um, yeah, I think one really important piece of advice that I, you know, it took me a while to appreciate is don't be afraid of failure. Failure is really just something that we experience basically on a daily basis. And when I fail, I'm actually, you know, when, 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 when a prediction or an expectation of what should happen with a, the with a theorem or a problem or uh, fails, I'm actually quite excited because that means it's more interesting than I thought, right? Um, so failure can really be an amazing, um, you know, a, a, an amazing teaching experience. You learn more from failure than you learn from success because it forces you to rethink things, right? So don't don't really think of it in that way. There's no real, there there's no um, uh, downside, and, and so if you if you can shut that part off, shut off that noise of being afraid of failure and what other people think, you can really go out there and try a lot of different things and see what works for you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tomita. <laughs> and last but not least, 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Brucia. I'm a senior in the neuroscience department. I'm also doing my thesis research in Dr. Morthy's lab, actually, so the description of that research should really qualify for me as well. Um, specifically, I am focusing on my thesis how this acoustic communication that she mentioned is coordinated with locomotion in that model of the fruit fly. Um, but a little bit more about my journey. I actually went to a small high school outside of Philadelphia, and we didn't really have a strong science and math program, so I went looking elsewhere and took my first intro to neuroscience course, which really blew my mind. Um, the brain is a fascinating thing, and it exists within all of us, so I really didn't need to look further than myself or my friend to find something I didn't understand. Um, so that really drove my path into Princeton, where I was really excited to start studying neuroscience. Um, I wanted to join a lab early, so in my sophomore fall, I joined Dr. Morthy's lab after shopping around for a little bit, and I'm happy to speak a little bit more about that if you guys want to know how to join labs here at Princeton. It's definitely a thing I recommend everyone do if you're interested. Um, I'm also pre-med, so I actually have my first med school interview tomorrow. So everyone, keep your fingers crossed. I'm a little nervous. Um, yeah, but I'm really happy to talk about the student side of these things. I'm sure everyone else can handle the other side, but I was also a student. I am still a student here at Princeton, um, so I really would love to talk about that. Um, as for some advice, uh, let's see. Definitely failure is a, is a learning experience. My very first midterm, I got a 54. So that was a rough learning curve for me. Um, don't worry though, the average was a 49, so it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you'll learn that quickly, is Princeton is really hard and really tough and definitely a different experience from high school. Um, but the learning curve is steep and I'm sure you will all do wonderful. Um, and my second bit of advice is that it's very easy to come onto campus and have imposter syndrome. You feel like everyone around you is brilliant. I mean, I'm sitting on a panel with five doctors and I'm a year out from my bachelor's degree, so I promise you, you're not alone. Everyone feels that way and you do belong to be here. Fantastic, thank you so very much. And, and, and so as you can see, we've had this wonderful assortment of, of experiences and knowledge and wisdom available to you. And so now we'd like to open it up to questions. Any questions that you might have about your own STEM journey, about our, the uh, scientists' journeys, or anything else that you'd like to question or share. We have about um, 15 minutes or so for questions. So would anybody like to start us off? And we'll just come around and I'll pass the microphone around. Hi, I'm Jayla Cornelius, and I'm thinking about doing civil and environmental engineering. And I just had a question for you all. Um, what were some of the challenges you faces, faced um, by being a woman in STEM, like in your careers? Wow, where to begin? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think that probably all of us up here have faced um, some challenges and some discrimination from being a woman in STEM. You know, when I started at MIT, there were less than 30% women in my entering class, and that was the highest percentage of women MIT had ever had, and certainly gotten better since then, but um, almost all of my classes, it was predominantly men. And that's continued throughout my career. I mean, I still occasionally go to conferences where I'm the only woman on the panel, or I'm, you know, maybe the only woman in the room. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just important to um, to make sure your voice is heard and to um, uh, you know, um, I guess follow the thing you're most passionate about. I would say, and it's I think it's always that passion that we come back to because it's what drives us and pushes us forward. Which is that you know we love doing science. We can't you know we love thinking about it. This is what we want to do. And um, you know you have to find that thing you're passionate about that I think will fuel you forward and allow you to kind of overcome those challenges. I don't know what you guys have to no, say. I'll just say, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned imposter syndrome. And I think we all struggle with it even now. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Everyone in the panel feels it as well. Uh, and so I think finding community so that you can bolster one another helps with that, whether it's student groups or roommates. Uh, and I think for me, uh, particularly in graduate school, there was only, were only two women in my program that when, when I was at University of Michigan. And when the other, one, other woman left, I realized I had no female friends because I had let work become my entire uh, life, because we love what we do. It's very easy for, for that to happen. And we, people talk about work-life balance, but when you love your work, it, you know, that life and work kind of merge, and it can be very easy to end up socializing primarily with people in your work world. 
And uh, I realized I needed to create spaces to interact with people that weren't part of my work world to make sure I, I had a better, a more diverse uh, set of friends and activities to do. And it can be easy, particularly at Princeton, when you have this very intense schedule and you have an intense desire to take part of everything, you can sometimes miss out on some of that social connection that's so important uh, to connect with a different set of people and also to help get the support to, to get through the more difficult times. I think, I think it's also, you know, there can be some really bad experiences, right? And so those are, we, we, we set those aside because those are hard to deal with and, and I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. But um, in general, you know, I also, spending so much time in math departments, being either the only woman or one of two women, and in a math department that n had never tenured a woman, there, was no, there had never been a woman professor, you know, in the history of the department, and Harvard is, is pretty old by the standards of. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit of sno European snobbery here. Um, no, but I just, uh, um, I, um, I, I think, it, you know, people have said things to me like the occasional comment. And the question is also what you do with that and what you make of it. And, and once you start to feel comfortable with yourself and feel that you are doing what you want to be doing, what you are passionate about doing, um, just shut that off as a noise. You shut it down. You know, it's just noise. It's who cares what other people think or what they may occasionally say. You know, so that that was kind of my strategy. It's funny. I was watching um, the Wimbledon final with Novak Djokovic playing against uh, Roger Federer and saying that every time people screamed Roger, he 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 told himself that he was hearing Novak. Um, <laughs> and and I and I thought that's kind, that's more or less how I've approached it. You know, in the sense that um, I kind of assumed the best of intentions. I tried to assume that it. You know, again, and these are not really bad experiences. These are just kind of the occasional comment. I just assumed that either the person had a bad day, or maybe they just maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe I, they just didn't really mean it, or or, or something. You know, and, and kind of continue with it because I think if you choose to linger over these comments too much, it can also be very destructive, right? And so I think um, you know there are certain things that you need to speak up against for sure, but there are certain things that you just you know what I'll just prove I'll just do what I do and I'll I'll, I'll do it you know I'll, I'll do it well. That that was certainly my strategy. I'm sure there are other strategies to cope with it, but 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 I, but for me it's it's really worked because it, I didn't feel. That, that negativity and toxicity all the time, you know? So, um, yeah. Just to uh, note that obviously, um, one of the things we know in terms of encouraging women in STEM is that we need to have role models and we need to have mentors. And so one of the, the impetus behind us having this panel is to show you a sampling of the amazing women here on campus who, I hate to go out on a limb like this, they haven't said this, but who are willing to hear from you and ask questions and you know beyond this panel that might be willing to, uh, to be an ear or uh, engage in conversation with you should any of these issues or questions come up. Um, so, and we're grateful to them for that. Other questions, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Stephanie Monson, and I'm planning to uh, major in chemical and biological engineering. Um, my question is actually more specifically for Rucha. Um, earlier, you mentioned like how you shopped around for different research opportunities before ultimately. Um, choosing yours. I was wondering if you could go a little more in depth of the process of how you went through that. Yeah, for sure. So luckily for us, Princeton has a lot of amazing faculty and our like professor to student ratio is very small and every student is required to do some form of independent work. So all of that kind of culminates in the fact that your professors are very willing to listen to you and very approachable, especially over email, even if you cold email them. Um, so what I did is as a sophomore, not really knowing what I was doing, um, I just emailed a few professors on the neuroscience website who interested me, whose research interested me. I read a few of their papers. Um, and from there, even if I, actually I didn't, Dr. Morthy is not one of the ones who I cold emailed, but what ended up happening is one of those professors forwarded my email along to her, and then that's how I found my lab. Um, and so the way that works is you can go in, you talk to the professor, um, you maybe talk to a few of their grad students or postdocs who are working in their lab, um, and then from there that's when I settled on Dr. Morthy's lab. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I, I can I can say from my perspective, um, you know, I always welcome emails from students who are in their freshman and sophomore year. So in your junior year, you'll officially have to choose a lab if you're going to do lab-based, you know, research for your senior thesis. Um, and especially emails like those um, from Rucha that are 
thoughtful, you know, tell me about um, why they're interested in my research in particular. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm usually eager to meet with such students. And then, uh, you know, in Rucha's case, um, she had already had some research experience. She was, you know, um, uh, it was clear, you know, why she wanted to work in my lab. And um, uh, it can be a really great opportunity on both sides. Because from my perspective, getting a student into the lab earlier um, allows them to do, you know, a really serious amount of work, right? They can spend multiple summers in the lab, um, you know, multiple years of research. And so it really can culminate in a very impressive body of work. And in many cases, undergraduates in my lab are authors on papers um, because of their significant contributions. I'm sure you guys have similar experiences. Yeah, I would say on average, I write a paper with an undergraduate student about once a year. And in many cases, the student's the lead author on the paper. You know, they, and again, exactly like you said, they might have started in my lab as a, as a junior and maybe did two years of work and a summer. I mean, they're, they're essentially functioning as a graduate student yeah. at the time that they graduate, if that's what they want to do. All right, thank you very much. Excellent, I think we had a hand up over here. Hello, um, my name is Rosemary Paulson, and I'm at the moment planning to major in chemical and biological engineering. Um, I was wondering if you guys have any advice on for a student who's struggling to decide between studying STEM and studying the humanities, especially with kind of the um, BSc prerequisites here that you have to fulfill and then declaring your major your freshman year. I think I might be the only person in the, in the, BS, in the BSc departments. I, I do think it can be a challenge. I think it's worth thinking about if you have a particular humanities subject you might be interested in to use whatever remaining you have in the freshman year for that. And if you really are strongly unsure that you're going to stay in BSc, it's possible for, you know, you want to pick most of the requirements freshman year, but it's possible you could kick one of them into sophomore year, particularly if it's something you don't know that you have a profound interest in, so you wouldn't necessarily take if you were going to go the other route. And I'll just say, after freshman year, the, the curriculum opens up substantially I think in terms of most people can take. I, I majored in electrical engineering when I was here, and I took two non-STEM classes every semester when I was here, so I took 16 non-STEM. So it is possible to do, particularly if you're, um, you know, careful in figuring out what order to, to take your requirements. So particularly if you have one humanities subject you're interested in, definitely try to take at least one course in that area this year. And then you'll really have a lot of opportunities sophomore year. So even if you declare an engineering major at the end of freshman year, you might still be exploring in the first semester of sophomore year and change your mind then if you feel that you need to. Um, yeah, I'm also a peer academic advisor, so to speak a little bit more about this. Um, the BSc requirements, there are a lot of them, but as she said, it's like very easy to take humanities courses if you might have to push them off till your sophomore year. And remember, it's always easier to switch from BSc to AB than it is to switch from AB to BSc. Yeah. So even if you declare end of your freshman year as a BSc student, as long as you've did, like, um, completed all of the prerequisites for the AB um, concentration you want to fulfill, you can do that at the end of your sophomore year too. You can switch out until the end of your sophomore year. So if you the humanities courses a little bit more too to get that freshman course load complete. You can do that and then shop around your sophomore year and see if you would like to switch. Yeah, exactly. For myself, I mean, I had a particular interest in Slavic studies, and so in those 16 courses, I, I almost majored in Slavic studies. <laughs> you know, in, in addition, I mean, I didn't do my, you know, the JPs and the thesis, but if you have a second thing, I figured, gee, I could do electrical engineering as a hobby and Slavic studies as a major or vice versa, and it seemed easier to do Slavic studies as a hobby and electrical engineering as a major. But you really, with, with you, there's enough freedom here in the curriculum, you can almost do a second major in terms of delving into a real serious passion beyond your STEM interests. Yeah, I had the same. I essentially minored in history as an undergraduate in biology. I think it's very common for scientists to have interests in the humanities. I know that's true of my colleagues. I'm sure it's true of your colleagues as well. So don't think you have to be kind of myopically focused on the sciences. I'm sure, yeah, none of us were or still are. And I think especially here, there's so many amazing things to take outside of the STEM stuff. It's crazy not to. That's right. I would be remiss if I didn't mention to everybody also that one of the things the um, CST is wonderful at is creating interdisciplinary courses. And so in the brochure that you received, you'll see courses that have STC as one of their designations, but they're also uh, interdisciplinary. So for example, we have engineering the arts. We have a course that is blends music and physics and engineering, um, technology and storytelling. So we have this robust array of courses that actually fulfill multiple requirements, particularly if you look for the courses that have the little asterisk 
uh, on the, in our brochure there. And so that can fulfill not only requirements, but also fulfill your passions in the various areas. Other well, questions? Thank uh, you. Sorry, and also, not only that, but they also show how you can actually merge these two worlds. Yes. They don't necessarily have to be separate, right? You can, right. You can live at the intersection. That's right, mm -hmm. and we want you there because that's what the world is. The world is not siloed the way that we think of in terms of various departments. You are always needing to draw upon various disciplines and the various ways of thinking within the different disciplines. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, wonderful. Pass. Can you pass that? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Julia. I'm interested in majoring in molecular biology. Um, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about what drew you uh, to academia and research as opposed to a different career path. Thanks. I can, I can chime in there. That's a great question about what draws someone to academia and research. As I mentioned, nobody in my family had a PhD, so this was a foreign uh, path, and I didn't realize until I got to college that you could go get a PhD in the sciences and not have to pay for it, that you could do a combination of teaching and research and, and go get a PhD and then have a career actually doing research and teaching. I think what drew me to academia was the fact that I fell in love with a research topic. I mean, for me, I, I feel fortunate that I discovered uh, birds and bird color vision rather early, but even if I discovered it later, I think I would have been drawn to the, um, the thrill of creating new knowledge and learning, learning about a new topic and working in a lab environment with students and postdocs. I found that all very exciting and it's, it's really kind of a, a, life of a life of the mind. You, you get to uh, be your own boss and come up with your own ideas and questions and use whatever tools you can find out there to, um, to sort of answer, answer these bigger questions. That said, there was a lot about academia I didn't understand as an undergrad, and you're fortunate here in that you're going to be surrounded by other academics, so you'll get a glimpse at what that life looks like. And really, by joining a lab and talking to graduate students, you can figure out what going to grad school might be like. It can be challenging to imagine other careers sometime because you are going to spend a lot of time with academics, but Princeton has wonderful opportunities for learning about careers that use science in many other dimensions. And so speaking to your peer advisors and to faculty members so that you can learn about what opportunities exist outside of academia is something that I would certainly encourage. Uh, if I can add something to that, um, as you're trying to figure that out, uh, it was mentioned that you can use your summers to do research. You can also look towards more industrial opportunities or working in a company or, or, or working in a slightly different field to try and figure out what, um, is, what you're really passionate about and what environment really works for you. So for me, academia um, was the clear <laughs> choice for me because I like teaching and I like interacting with students as well as more senior scientists and getting um, that exposure for, to different things and the freedom to study a problem sort of on a fundamental side and not be driven by um, having certain metrics or having to meet certain deadlines. Well, we still have lots of deadlines, but um, it's a very different environment working in a company versus working um, in a university. So. Excellent, thank you, and I think we have time for one last question. If anybody has one last burning question before we end. There's just a minute. Thank you, don't be shy. Hi, my name is Rithi, and um, I'm not completely sure what science I want to major in yet. But I had a question, a lot of you mentioned um, something about freshmen working in a lab to get experience. So. Um, I was wondering how, like I know you said you emailed professors and they like got back to you, but in terms of like fitting that into the schedule of freshman year, like how much time does it take up? Like can I have a job and still work in the lab or like will I be able to handle my classes while doing that? So yeah, I was wondering if you talk about how much time working in a lab takes up. Uh, so I, I actually have a freshman working with me. Uh, in his case, he started um, 
very eager to get in the lab. So he actually started before uh, the first semester of freshman year. Um, what he discovered was that he couldn't actually manage being in the lab and taking all of the first set of courses, being in the band and all of these things. Um, and so I would recommend maybe using your first semester to sort of figure things out before you um, immediately try to join a lab. Figure out what works best in terms of time management because um, one thing I've learned about a lot of fresh, uh, Princeton undergraduates is that you organize your time incredibly well. Uh, I don't know if you come in with that skill or it's something you develop while you're here, um, but that's important uh, because you want to be able to devote some amount of time to the work that's being done in the lab. Um, and maybe it's helpful to just wait until you have um, some body of time you can dedicate, start, and then figure out how to integrate that with your coursework. Yeah, I, I will say that um, you all will be signing up for classes tomorrow, and it might look like you have a lot of free time, because it's not like <laughs> high school. I promise you, you do not. <laughs> that disappears very quickly. Um, that being said, I think um, time management is definitely something to learn, and I think if you want to make the lab a priority, you can. Just be very upfront with the PI and whoever is your direct mentor, whether it be a grad student or a postdoc, of what their expectations are, what your expectations are. You can even set, a, set up a schedule with them if you really need to like, keep the strict hours. There are definitely ways to work it into, I think, any schedule on campus. Um, and of course, the time you devote to the lab will probably increase over your four years as you move towards independent research. And just maybe one last point, you mentioned a job. There are work study opportunities that would allow you to do research in a lab. So be sure to check out the student employment website and talk to your advisors about how you might be able to combine the two. So excellent. Well, I hope you'll all join me in thanking our panelists for their time and their expertise today. <laughs> Wonderful. I think it's probably very apparent that you have a cadre of amazing people here who are all very interested and invested in your success. And I want to add the CST to that list. We want to support you and make sure that we're giving you programming and opportunities that really meet your needs and desires. So do please take the moment to fill out that survey that you were given and hand that in, please. Do take a look at our website. We have opportunities this year. For the first time, we're starting a student advisory board because we want the student voice to be heard in terms of our programming so that you can let us know what you are interested in. So do visit our website for that application. Uh, and there are many ways to engage with us. So on behalf of the CST, thanks again to our wonderful panelists. And thank you all to all of you. Have a wonderful new academic year. And welcome to Princeton, for those of you who are new. Thank you.